Welcome back, friends, to Unite We Pray. As with last week's episode, this week features Matt Martins again, this time in a Q&A format after his lecture from last week. If you haven't listened to the last two episodes, I'd encourage you to do that before listening to this one. But as always, hope you're encouraged to think about these things and pray. There's some heavy stuff in these recent episodes, and uh, in one sense, we're sorry about that, but we hope that it helps you think well about the world we live in and how we can pray to improve it. Uh, so thanks as always for listening. Grace and peace. Friends, a couple notes for our time here as we move into time of q and I'm still getting questions. So if you have one and you haven't submitted it, go ahead. I'll see it. Uh, not promising we can get to all of them, uh, but I see some good ones in here. Second, if you can't see us, feel free to move. We, uh, we had to pick a side of the a podium, so you're not being distracting if you want to scoot around to the other side. Lastly, this Slido link, as Isaac mentioned at the beginning, that has uh, some other links in it. So even if you don't want to a- ask a question, I would encourage you to check that one out. There's links to pre-order Matt's book, links for more information on United We Pray, uh, and other good stuff. So, moving What do you on. got? Oh, I got a bunch, Matt. Um, but I wanted to ask you one from the jump, because I can do that. Um, which is, I wanted to t- ask you about the Flowers case. Yeah. And I hear people all the time talk about how racial disparities, bad laws, things like that are a thing of the past. And I think the assumption is, as soon as the bad law is fixed, everything is better. Yeah. That's clearly not the case, right? Yeah. Do you see that in other areas of the criminal justice system? Well, if everything, the, 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 the U.S. Constitution was amended in the wake of the Civil War and the Reconstruction Amendments. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were meant to outlaw slavery, to guarantee equal protection of the laws, to guarantee that you won't be denied the right to vote on the basis of race. And we know as a fact that while those things were, den- were outlawed in 1865, we know that they were still occurring in 1965. I mean, just to take the example of the 15th Amendment, prohibiting the exclusion of voters on the basis of race. That didn't become against the law in 1965 with the Voting Rights Act. That became against the law in 1868 or 71 with the adoption of the 15th Amendment. And similarly, the outlawing of selecting jurors on the basis of race or applying criminal law on the basis of race was outlawed with the Reconstruction Amendments in the 1800s, and yet you can read case after case from the Supreme Court. I just used one example, 1986, where the Supreme Court, and not until 1986, outlaws the use of, says what these prosecutors are doing violates the Constitution. It's not that it became illegal in 1986. It was illegal. They just said this latest and greatest method that prosecutors were using was unconstitutional. And so, but then, you, but then even then, so we're 1986, 120 years after Reconstruction or after the Civil War, and yet we're seeing in 2019, prosecutors are just inventing new ways to evade the rules. So yes, the law is part of achieving justice, the, imp- the adoption of the law, but the implementation of the law is also part of achieving justice. And there's a resistance to uh, the law doesn't automatically change hearts. It does make things illegal, but people who are intent on continuing in that behavior will find ways to evade it. So that ongoing implementation is as much reason as any to dig in. That's not a reason yeah. to sit back. No, not at all. And in fact, I think that one of the, I mean, I know you and I have talked about this before, but you probably have all heard of things like qualified immunity, which give police uh, immunity from federal civil rights suits for violating your constitutional rights. Qualified immunity leaves, at least leaves open a glimmer of possibility that police can be prosecuted if they violate your constitutional rights intentionally. Prosecutors have absolute immunity. There's no, there's no exception clause. A prosecutor could intentionally strike jurors on the basis of race, and he or she cannot be sued civilly for a wrongful conviction that results from that. Yeah, that's crazy. So, so you wanna know why implementation doesn't happen just because the law changes, because the, the law that would provide an enforcement mechanism like civil liability under federal civil rights suits has been, in, has been interpreted to have an exception that gives prosecutors total immunity from responsibility for violating your constitutional rights. So, I mean, I often hear when you see these exoneration cases, people say, they should sue the prosecutor. They can't sue the prosecutor. Not under the federal civil rights statute, the prosecutor is totally immune from, law, from federal civil rights lawsuits. 
Well, we could dwell on that for a while. Let's move on to these questions here. We'll start with an easy one. How do you define justice? So, so I define justice the way Augustine defined justice because Augustine is always a good answer to anything. Uh, he's smarter than me and people have adopted his view. So Augustine defines justice as giving to every man his due. Giving to every man, to every man, his due, what he's owed. And what we know from scripture is that what people are owed is our love. That was a revolutionary discovery for me because I tended to think of loving others as my generosity. Like I was being good to you. You didn't really deserve it. So if I loved you, I was giving you something you weren't entitled to, but that's not what scripture says. Paul in Romans 13 says, no, oh, no man, every, oh no man anything except to love. We have an obligation to love. You as a fellow human being ha- are entitled to my love. You are due my love, you are owed my love. It's not something I dispense or don't dispense at my discretion. I mean, I may, but you are entitled to it. And so if, if justice is defined by Augustine as the giving to every man is due, then, uh, and people are due our love, then justice is giving to everyone our love. And what it means to love is to will, again, the Christian definition of loving is to will and seek the good of another. So justice is to give to everyone what they are due, my love, which is my effort to will and seek their good. Next question is related. How do we love criminals and victims at the same time? So that's, that's what I was trying to get at with the idea of accuracy, right? We, we love the victim by rendering an accurate verdict, and we love the perpetrator by rendering, rendering an accurate verdict. We love victims by rendering an accurate verdict that, uh, that deters, that protects society, that, that holds people accountable for the wrongs they've done. And yet at the same time, that's loving to the perpetrator because it is, is God's method of disciplining them, ultimately to bring them to repentance. And so it's not, it's not intention, it's not unloving to punish someone. It's unloving to punish someone for a reason other than willing and seeking their best. Right? If I'm punishing someone because I want you to hurt because I hurt, that's not loving and thus that's not God's justice. But if I punish you because I want you to repent, I want you to turn around, I want you back, that is both loving the victim because I'm holding accountable the person who did them wrong, and yet I'm administering the punishment not just to inflict pain, but to inflict change. Got it. Makes sense. Uh, this next question is, is more procedural. What's the result of a non-unanimous jury? So a non-unanimous jury is what's called a mistrial, hung jury, uh, and you do it again. Start over with a new jury. Uh, clarification question. Did you mean to say that the race of the criminal, not the victim, determines death sentence? No, I did not. Okay. That the data shows that the race of the victim is what drives the death sentence. So let me put a finer point on that. We have made a statement and as a nation. We make a statement through the administration of our death penalty that white lives matter more that you are more likely to be sentenced to death for killing a white person than a black person. I'll just give a couple examples of this. In 1991, September of 1991, Pee-wee Herman, or Herman Pee-wee Gaskins was executed in the state of South Carolina, a white man for killing a black person. That was the first time in since 1944, 1700 intervening executions since a white man had been executed in the United States for killing a black man. 1944 to 1991, 1,700 executions, not a single one of a white man for killing a black man. That's that, what the evidence shows. The, the, no one seriously disputes the findings of the Baldus study, not the dissent in the Supreme Court case where it was reviewed, not the majority, not the dissent. Everyone accepted that the evidence showed to a statistical certainty that the race of the victim drives the administration of the death penalty. Wow. 
how can a system dispense proportional justice when people get killed before they can even get to trial? I'm sorry, say that again? How can a system dispense proportional justice when people get killed before they can even get to trial? So it can't. And I think that that's where I think it's important as Christians to recognize that the, the justice we can achieve in this world is intermediate, it is temporary, it is provisional, but there will be ultimate justice. And so while we could lose hope at the instances, whether caused by that circumstance or others where we can't achieve justice, we, we can hope and, and, and have confidence. By hope, I mean we can have confidence as Christians that God will set all wrongs right. He will make all things new. Well, I, I like that question because I hear some version of it all the time stated as an objection. Well, if they didn't want to get killed, they shouldn't have been doing X. Mm -hmm. How can we better talk about those situations in ways that reflect proportionality? Are you talking about the victims shouldn't have been doing X? Yes. Someone, someone is killed in a police interaction and people rush to justify the police because of some other infraction. He shouldn't have been selling loose cigarettes. Yeah. So, I mean, these are, I mean, yeah, selling Aaron Garner, right? So, you know, what you're raising is a, a, another question, which I touch on in my book, but is the question of policing. So all of this comes back to this question for us as Christians. What authority do you have to, to punish, or more precisely, to use physically coercive force against other people? So you have to understand the criminal justice system is the administration of coercive physical force against other people. It's, it's the use of violence against other people. No one goes to jail without actual or threatened physically coercive violence. Right? Either you go in the cell or we're stuffing you in. Either you submit to the command to stop fleeing or we will shoot you. Either you stay within that cell or we will shoot you when you try to car climb the fence. Right? It, that's not to condemn it. I just want to describe the criminal justice system operates by violence. That's how it functions, actual or threatened violence. So that raises a profound question for us as Christians, which is what authority do I have to use physical violence against another human? The answer to that from Scripture is that all authority is God's, and I have only that authority delegated. And so it's not enough to say, well, that person had been resisting, and if they hadn't been resisting, the police officer wouldn't do X. As a Christian, you have to back up and say, what authority did the police officer have to do X? I don't mean what legal authority. Yeah. I mean, what moral authority did they have? I mean, there's lots of discussion in Christian ethical thinking and ethical teaching about when it is moral to use physical force, whether by the state or as an act of self-defense. And, um, and, and this would be sort of analogous to the self-defense of the officer protecting himself. And the, the ethic, criminal, ethic, criminal uh, Christian ethical teaching is very clear that deadly force must be used only as a last resort. Christian ethical teaching is not unclear about this. Stand your ground laws, for example, are immoral. I don't care how much you like them, you may be offended by that tonight, they are immoral. Because valuing human life uh, raises, means we, we value even the Samaritan. Yeah. And, and that means that we exercise only that authority that God has delegated to us. And God has delegated to me the authority to use physical violence against other, deadly force against other people only as a last resort. Yeah. So in those circumstances, you as a Christian, you have to answer, ask the question, was that physical violence, even if that person resisted wrongly, was that physical, was that deadly violence used as a last resort? Because if it was not, it was not Christian. Yeah, that's good, Matt. <laughs> when one party promotes harsh or hasty justice and the other the abdication of justice, how do Christians work towards change through the political system? Well, I am not a political scientist or a criminologist, 
Um, you know, the, these, I, 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 I don't say that lightly. I, what I've tried to do in writing on this topic is stay in the lane that I have expertise on. Um, you know, should we vote as Christians taking into account what we believe justice means? Yes. Uh, but the particulars of then sort of what policy we should adopt to combat a particular evil in the system is something that Christians of good faith who share my commitment to justice, who share my commitment to Christian ethics, who share my understanding of the Bible, it's something on which they could disagree. And so one thing I've really tried to stay away from in my book is saying, so that means the Christian must do X right. with this particular policy. I do feel like I can stand in front of you and on the authority of of God's word say that you have an obligation to love the criminally accused and that you have an obligation to design and implement criminal justice policies that seek and will the good of, the, of all participants in this system. But I don't think I can stand in front of you and, and compel you and say God demands that you do this particular uh, policy, pers- you know, you adopt this particular policy to achieve that end. Christians can disagree about that. Those are matters of prudence and wisdom. And so I've really tried to, while I have my views on particular issues, hot button criminal issues, I don't, I've, I've tried to avoid saying this is the only Christian way to respond to that. There are a lot of reasons why his book is good, but it, his care to not bind the conscience unnecessarily is near the top of the list. Y'all, this book is fantastic. You offered one uh, recommendation in regards to voting in the book that I felt especially smoked by, which was you asked the question, who's your DA? Right. Does yeah. your district attorney have you know, violations on their record? Yeah. Are you, I, I don't know. Right. I've never thought about that. Yeah. I mean, I think that... I think the most compelling, I mean, I could, this, this is a longer riff and you'll have to read it in my book. So you'll have to just trust my shortened version of it or wait to read the book and conclude I'm right or wrong. But we, there's a concept in, in moral theory called pro, uh, moral proximity. The, 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 the idea is I have a greater moral obligation to intervene uh, in the lives of those who are more morally proximate to me than others. So just to take a simple example, my obligation to my wife is greater than my obligation to Isaac. My obligation to my kids is greater than my obligation to your kids. My obligation to your kids is greater than my obligation to kids halfway around the world. Uh, because, because I'm a finite person, and so my ability to intervene uh, in situations is different, and so that drives my moral obligation. And I, have, I am morally proximate to the criminal justice system in a democracy in a way I am not in a, in a monarchy. I have more responsibility for what the government leaders do in a democracy than I am in a non-democratic system. Uh, I have, because I have the ability, I have a relationship with them that creates obligation. And so I think that means among other things that there's a moral obligation to vote uh, because I am responsible for what those folks are doing, which means, among other things, I'm morally responsible to empower the good and restrain the evil ones who are acting on my behalf. But that requires that I know who they are. I mean, lots of, lots of politicians we can't vote for on a single issue. We're necessarily faced with an array of issues that that politician is gonna deal with, and I've gotta weigh competing issues. But your district attorney is a one-issue vote. What do they think about criminal justice? And are we gonna vote again for the DA who six times had convictions reversed for, for striking jurors on the basis of race? Or are we gonna recognize I have a moral obligation to hold that prosecutor accountable, which requires just that I even know who they are and then requires that I show up. Does the machinery of the criminal justice system make it easier to walk past people in ditches? What can we do about that? Of course it does, because, because I don't even have to see them. Right? At least the priest and the Levite had to like, take affirmative steps to avoid getting a close-up view of the man lying in the ditch. I, can, I don't even have to avert my eyes 
to avoid looking at what the criminal justice system does to other people. Right? I don't even have to avert my eyes. It all happens behind, behind big wooden doors and Roman columns somewhere downtown. I don't even have to drive around it. I can, I can drive by it without even, without even paying any attention. It all happens invisible to me if I want it to with no effort. In fact, it will happen invisible to me unless I actually cross the street and look in the ditch. And that's part of what I'm trying to do in the book is force people to cross the street and look in the ditch. Yeah, that's really good. How does and how should the criminal justice system understand and assess repentance? So I think that that's the point that a system should be striving for. This is a larger discussion about sentencing, but we used to have what was called indeterminate sentencing, which meant a judge would sentence you to five to 15 years, and there would be a parole board who was genuinely trying to determine, has there been meaningful change in this person's life? And if there was, then five years would be enough. And if not, then the person might have to say seven or nine or 12 or 15. But in the late 1970s into the early 80s, there became a movement called Truth and Sentencing, which was, we're not gonna sentence people to five to 15 and then them, then them only serve five. We're gonna give them a sentence and they're gonna serve that sentence. And we don't care how much they reformed, we don't care how much they repented. You do the crime, you're gonna do the time. And, and that, that became the dominant mindset. It is still the dominant mindset, but that system, lacks forward-looking proportionality. That system looks back and says, this is what that person deserves. But it doesn't look forward and say, but does what it, is what it deserves actually what it takes? In other words, we can look back and say, this person deserves to lose an eye because they took an eye. But the goal of criminal justice is not to take eyes. The goal of criminal justice is to bring people back right? It's to bring them back. It's to welcome them home. It's to be the father who runs out and says, welcome home. And when we say, you're going to get the sense and we don't care if you repent, what we're saying is we don't want you back. Instead of saying, we want you to repent. We want to save your soul. That's really good, man. Is the death penalty ever just? Yes. You need me to elaborate on that? Well, I just, I know the answer you gave in your book. Yeah, so, I, so the death penalty is the single biggest moral issue on which I've changed my mind as an adult. I believe that the, in theory, the death penalty is permitted by scripture. In other words, it is not categorically immoral to administer the death penalty. When I was a younger adult, if you had asked me, I would have been like, Genesis 9, 6, he who sheds man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. Next topic. And what I would encourage you to do, if that's your view, is to do what I have done in the years since, which is keep reading. Because there's more in the Bible about the death penalty than Genesis 9-6. There's an obligation to accuracy. Uh, there is an obligation to impartiality. And since, since the death penalty was reinstated in the United States in the mid-1970s, uh, there have been 184 people who have been sentenced to death who were innocent. Not, no, I'm, not, I'm not talking about people who got their convictions reversed because of legal technicalities. I'm talking about people who were sentenced to death, who did not do it. Many of whom spent decades in prison before they were exonerated. On average, it takes 15 years for someone who was wrongly sentenced to death to be exonerated. Uh, 184 people, 2%, one out of every 50 people sentenced to death in the United States is innocent. I'm not talking about actually ultimately uh, executed. I'm talking about of the, of the around 8,000 death sentences handed down since the mid-1970s, 184, about 2%, a little over 2% were innocent. And given that we know it takes about 15 years for an exoneration, statistical modeling done in a study published by the National Academy of Sciences estimates that about 4% of people sentenced to death are innocent. So one out of every 25. And so I just ask, would you send your kid into a room where one out of 50 or one out of 25 people would be shot? And if not, why are we sending someone else's kids in? What has been your experience of Christians in the court system? 
underrepresented, average, or overrepresented? And do you think more Christians would help the process? You mean how many Christians participate as police or prosecutors? Is I'm that assuming question? that's what they mean. Yeah. So I, I've known over the years many people who would be professing Christians. My brother is a police detective, has been a police detective for more than 20 years in Tampa, Florida. Uh, my uncle was, uh, rose to be the third highest person in the New Jersey State Troopers. Um, you know, I have, I know in my family, I was a federal prosecutor for nine years. I knew fellow federal prosecutors when I was a federal prosecutor in my office who were Christians. So I've known uh, many people who were Christians and who shared uh, my concern, probably in some instances, uh, evident, you know, displayed it better than I did uh, as, as in their role uh, as prosecutors or police officers or otherwise. Is there one issue in the criminal justice system that you feel American Christians are especially silent on or responding incorrectly to? I would say that I don't think people appreciate that somewhere around 97% of cases are resolved through plea bargaining. Yeah. And I don't think, in other words, there's no TV show about plea bargaining, right? It's always trials. I can guarantee you a TV show about plea bargaining would not make it past the pilot episode. Uh, the, the, so people, I tend to, I think, because they see TV, they see Tom Cruise and A Few Good Men, or they see Law and Order, they think the criminal justice system is about trials, and the criminal justice system is about plea bargaining. Somewhere between 94 and 97 percent of cases every year are resolved through guilty pleas. And I think people do not understand, and I say, this is my regular line about plea bargaining, I don't care what your politics, you should hate plea bargaining in America. You should hate plea bargaining in America. Plea bargaining operates on injustice. That's the only way it functions. Because you have two constitutional provisions that guarantee you the right to a jury trial. It's in there twice. So how do we, why is everybody waving the right to a jury trial and pleading guilty? Is there just like this crisis of conscience among 97% of criminal defendants? Or are we coercing them or bribing them into pleading guilty. And if you think about it, there's, that it is in fact the only way we get people to plead guilty. We either threaten them with a sentence that is unjustly severe, or we induce them with a sentence that is unjustly lenient. So I don't care if you're law and order or bleeding heart, you should hate American style plea bargaining. And you have examples in the book where it, it became so disadvantageous for people to go to trial, the risk became so great that it's, that's the calculus, Yeah, I mean, right? it, we know, we know as a fact, scientific fact, that people have pled guilty to crimes they did not commit, to murders they did not commit, were sentenced to death having pled guilty to murders they did not commit. And we should pause and ask ourselves, What's going on with the system where people think I'm better off pleading guilty to a murder I didn't commit than going through the system that they're offering me? Well, I hate to end it on that one, but we should call it on time. Um, friends, would you join me in thanking Matt for coming down here? Thank you for having me. We're going to have our time of prayer next, um, but I do want to make just two comments on the front end, uh, just in reflection on your talk, Matt, uh, and all that you've said here. Number one, so I'm listening, you know, as a, as, a, as a Christian, as an American citizen, a citizen in this country, someone who lives in Birmingham, I'm also listening as a pastor, and I think it's useful to highlight that while this is about criminal justice, this is just so helpful for a church to hear because we are always rendering verdicts when we're confronting someone in sin. And I don't just mean pastors, I mean church members. We're always thinking, is what she did, is what he did, is what they did wrong? So those principles that you were equipping us with, they, they just, they affect obviously the criminal justice system, but our justice system as believers. And yeah, just a place where there are redeemed 
criminals. Um, so thank you for that. That's one thought. The second is just your stuff on love. I think is just so, it is so natural to, to not believe or to assume that someone has to earn my love. In other words, it is so natural to assume you do not deserve my love until you earn it. And to think that this person, I owe them my love, regardless of what they've done, is just so mind-boggling. It reminds me that that is exactly what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 5, when he says, Matthew 5, 46, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? I think Paul would say we're merely being human, right? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. This comes in the context of loving your enemy. And this is striking. Jesus says at the beginning of that section, you have heard that it was, it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and, oh, watch this. Pray for those who persecute you. Isn't that striking? Love them, pray for them. And so we are here to pray. I've got a few different ways we're going to pray. And the first is this. We're just going to take some time to pray silently. Uh, We live in a very loud world. We're downtown. It's loud. Let's just take a minute or two and pray anything your heart is carrying in regards to what you've heard tonight. So let's take a minute or two to pray silently, asking the Lord to help us when it comes to understanding what it is to love our neighbor, however unlovely they may be in light of what we've heard. Let's pray. Let's pray silently now. Sisters and brothers, the next way we're going to pray is this. I've got a few prayer prompts that I'm going to share. Uh, And if you just grab the person you came with or two or three folks around you, uh, my fellow introverts, I know this sounds terrible, but if you grab a couple folks around you and pray through these prompts, that will be great. In terms of what to pray for, you can write this down. I'm going to repeat this list, okay? Let's praise, praise God who is love. Praise him for his love. We can only love because he first loved us, 1 John 4, 19. Let's praise God who is love. Let's confess our lovelessness, our lack of giving our neighbor their due, especially our unlovely neighbors. So let's confess our own lack of love. Let's thank God for the reform and progress that has already happened in this country regarding the criminal justice system. Let's not act like we're the first ones to talk about this. And let's ask God to make our churches places where people can come back. Uh, That whole idea. Let's ask God to make our churches places where people can come back. All right, what are we praying for? Let's praise God who is love, praise him for his love. We can only love because he first loved us, 1 John 4, 19. Let's confess our lovelessness, our lack of giving our neighbor their due, especially our unlovely neighbors. Let's confess our own lack of love. Let's thank God for the reform and progress that has already happened in this country regarding the criminal justice system. Let's ask God to make our churches places where people can come back. Let's break out into groups and pray for these things. And I'll give some more instructions on how we're going to keep praying. Let's pray. Friends, I hate to break up group prayer. You can pray together and pray. Or uh, you can pray after we're done as well. Um, We're going to take some time to pray as a group together now. Uh, So let me just see if I have some volunteers to pray briefly. Let us meditate on the word briefly real quick. Briefly. Think congregational prayer. I see, see you've been trained for such a time as this. Some volunteers to pray about the following things. Uh, so you'll stand up where you are uh, after I'm done, and someone will bring you the mic, my congregational prayer. Here we go. Or Matt, that's our like Sunday evening stuff. Uh, would someone pray thanking God for loving us while we were still his enemies? Romans 5.10. Just a 
Brief prayer, meditating on the gospel. Can someone pray? Thank you, Kelly. Uh, would someone be willing to pray that God would make us strong and courageous when it comes to loving our neighbors? We just went through Joshua as a church. Would someone pray that God would give us strength and courage to will and seek the good of our neighbor? Thank you. Would someone pray thanking God for welcome, welcoming us back? Think of the prodigal son you just talked about. So all your stuff, it just goes back. Would someone pray just thanking God for welcoming us back as his children? Excellent. Thank you, Mango. Uh, would someone pray that the criminal justice system of Alabama would become more just and that we would see our part in making it more just? And that might just be learning our DA's name. Start there. I need to do that. Thank you, Dustin. Uh, would someone pray for Matt's forthcoming book, that the Lord would bless it and use it to help Christians be more just. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. And Matt, why don't you come up here while we pray? You're going to close us in prayer, so Matt will go last. Uh, so if you know what you're praying for, just stand up where you are. Someone's going to bring you a mic. And then, Matt, you'll close us in prayer, and we all uh, say... Some closing remarks. Let's pray together. If you agree with the prayer, uh, if you're praying, please say amen at the end. It helps us know you're done. Uh, and if you agree with what that person prayed, say amen and say it loudly so that people out here can hear it. So let's just say amen after a prayer. Let's pray. God, we thank you and praise you that we know what love is because you first loved us, that you have loved us while we were yet sinners, while we were enemies, you came and took on the greatest injustice of all time and died in our place. And God, we praise you that that is our anchor, that is our hope, that that is um, what drives us in all that we believe. Um, and that is what gives us the hope of repentance and restoration is that while we were yet sinners, you loved us. And God, I just thank you and praise you that um, that is what you have um, given us to anchor ourselves in. We love you and praise you and ask these. Nope, we don't ask anything. We just praise you. <laughs> Amen. Lord, Father God, I ask that you'd make each of us strong and courageous for what is right that in the choice between what is easy or evil, that we would choose what is right and good, that we'd refuse to cross to the other side of the road. When things in our path are unjust or wrong, where there's an opportunity to do what is right, strengthen us, quicken our spirit. Let us be your people and show a world that there is a just God who is very much alive and will bring all things to an end. Amen. Father, we thank you for welcoming us back. And Lord, we confess that we don't even understand how much you have welcomed us back. But Lord, we ask that you would take the scales off our eyes to help us see what you have done in our lives. Lord, so that we might be all the more encouraged to do this for our brothers and sisters, particularly those who um, are in a carceral setting. Father, we ask that you grow Christian hospitality in this church and in this city. Lord, that we might be more prepared to welcome others back. But Lord, we just praise you for the ways that you have welcomed us, that you've accepted us, that you have called us home, that you call us by name. We are so thankful for you, Lord. Amen. Father, we thank you for this good reminder that um, your salvation is not just for a kingdom that's coming, but that you have called us to be your hands and feet in all that we do. That there's no part of life where we're not called to be Christians. And so I pray that we would be um, burdened tonight in a godly way uh, with that call, uh, that we would leave this room stirred up, see how we can see the criminal justice system in Birmingham and in Alabama be more and more just, uh, loving 
and kind. God, that we would uh, stir up other followers of Jesus to be burdened for these things, that we would see your kingdom come more and more. Father, that we would not leave here and forget all that we have heard. Um, that we not get caught up in uh, the things that are right before us, but Lord, that we would um, stir one another up towards holiness. And in this situation, holiness means being involved, caring, reaching out to our DA, finding out how we can be the hands and feet of Jesus in these situations. So Lord, stir change up that we would be more and more just. God, Alabama is a state where there's a lot of people who profess Christ. I pray that that profession would transform into transformation in our criminal justice system, Lord. So please bring that. We need your help and we ask for the power of your spirit to do these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Dear Lord, thank you for Matt being here tonight and sharing with us um, the things that he has reflected on deeply, Lord, that you have taught him. And I thank you for the burden you've placed on his heart to um, go deeper and um, discover what your heart is on criminal justice, Lord. And as we now, Lord, prepare for his book that will be coming out in November. Um, I pray that, that you would place in our hearts an earnest desire to have a heart of justice like yours, and that the, the reflections and the revelations, Lord, that are going to come forth from this book would stir our hearts, Lord, that they would stir up dialogue with your spirit. Um, in our hearts to say, God, make me like you, and, and how can I be like you in, in this area? And so we just thank you for the gift of his, um, of his work, God, and, and what this will be for us as the body, and pray that we would become more just people, and that it would drive us, Lord, ever the more to you and to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, Matt's going to close us in prayer before he does. He has something he wants to say. So I never set out to write a book. I never set out to be an activist. But writing this book made me spend the better part of two years thinking about this question that I would commend to you. I spent all my free time virtually, reading and thinking about this question, what does it mean to love my neighbor as myself? Recently, Matthew West had a song that just hits me because of that. I've read the words in red, he sings, how you left the 99. To find the one missing feels like that was written with me on your mind. And the prodigal son he ran leaving his home behind. The part where the father comes running to meet him. Did you say that with me on your mind? I pray that we would be people who would like the father who ran for us, run to other people who need him. Let's close in prayer. Father, as people made in the image of God, we have a responsibility to be the images of God, to reflect your character, reflect your justice, reflect your love, and we confess that we fall short, that we ask who is our neighbor, that we wanna shrink the neighborhood of obligation, that we wanna love the cul-de-sac but not down the street, Lord, I pray that as people who you have come run to, running to meet, that we would be people who go running to meet. Those who need you, who need to know about your love, who need to know about your justice. And may we do that all in hope that you will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. May we hope that your kingdom will have no end. We pray this in the name of the only just judge. Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. See you at Sunday at four o'clock.